<laughs> um, so uh, we're going to get started with the program. Um, Welcome to the Headwater Streams webinar series. We're really pleased to have you with us this afternoon um, and hopefully for the rest of, of this week through Thursday each afternoon. Uh, this program is being offered through a partnership between the Estuary Program, Cornell University, and Hudsonia, um, and with participation from the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. We have a really great lineup of speakers and are looking forward to interacting with you over the course of the next few afternoons. I'm going to start off the program with a brief introduction to um, just to some of the Zoom features we'll be using and a little background about our program. Uh, so just to get started, um, for those, hopefully you're you're hearing audio okay, um, but if, if you're having difficulties connecting to audio, you can call in. Um, this should be the call-in number and the meeting ID that should have been sent around in the meeting invitation as well. So if you're having difficulties or if your internet bandwidth is low, I recommend trying to call in um, and doing the audio that way. Um, and this is also, you know, if you're having difficulty connecting um, a headset or something like that, there's this little arrow next to the mute button on the lower left corner of your screen. If you hover your mouse at the bottom, that should pull up these different options to switch your, um, your speaker uh, that the computer is using. You can also alternate between um, the speaker view and gallery view. Um, so when we are not presenting, I recommend, you know, if you want to switch over to, to gallery view um, and see other people, we'll hopefully be able to have some kind of interaction um, even on this platform and you can see everyone else who's participating that way. That's at the, the upper right corner of your screen. And um, if you want, you can also open up the participant window along the bottom of your screen when you hover down there and see other people who are there. I'll show you another function related to that shortly. Um, and that you can also open up the chat box there uh, as well. So if you have um, questions as we're going along, feel free to use the chat box to reach out to us. Um, now I've opened up here um, showing you what the participant window looks like. Um, next to your name, there's this little button that says more. And I invite you to go ahead and um, click that more button and then go to rename and perhaps add your affiliation or where you're from to that um, so that it'll show up next to your name and we'll have a little bit more information about you in the participant window. Um, so right now you're muted and we'll try to keep people muted during the presentations um, but feel free to raise your hand. Um, you can do that through the Zoom function, again, in the participant window, there's a little button for raising your hand, or you can just kind of try to ra <laughs> raise your hand through the video and um, get our attention that way. We are recording the webinar um, for our internal use, and uh, if for some reason you end up missing a day um, because of something coming up, we'll, we'll be happy to share the recording, um, but we're not planning to post it on the website. Um, some of you may be interested in certificates for municipal training credit, and those will be available at the end of the week after the program is over. Um, so I also wanted to just make a special weather statement in case you haven't been following the news. Um, we are anticipating some kind of tropical storm or heavy rainfall tomorrow afternoon, and there's a chance that uh, we may lose power or be unable to hold the webinar. Um, so just be aware um, in that event that we have to cancel tomorrow afternoon. Our um, plan is to continue on Wednesday and then Wednesday, Thursday and hold the fourth day on Friday afternoon at the same time at three o'clock. Um, so hopefully we can go ahead as planned tomorrow, um, but that's our, our backup weather plan. All right, so um, that's it kind of for the, the Zoom basics. Um, so switching gears, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Hudson River Estuary Program, we're a unique 
program at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation helped to, uh, to, to, sorry, established to help people enjoy, protect, and revitalize the Hudson River and its valley. And we work throughout the 10 counties bordering the tidal Hudson River, shown here on the map. Um, and we work through these different ways, through providing grant funding for planning, access, and education projects. We work on research, education, and training. We work on natural resource conservation and protection projects, restoration projects, and by providing community planning assistance. And within the estuary program, I'm part of the conservation and land use team, along with Nate Nardi Cyrus, who will be uh, a presenter in this training. And we work with municipalities, land trusts, and other partners to incorporate important habitats and water resources and natural areas into conservation and land use planning and decision making. Um, so this program is part of a biodiversity education partnership between the Estuary Program and Hudsonia, which is a local nonprofit environmental education and research institute that we've worked with for nearly 20 years to deliver training programs for municipal officials, land trust staff, and others um, involved in this arena of conservation and land use planning. Um, in the estuary watershed. And this course would typically have been an in-person kind of one day intensive program that would have components including hands-on mapping, a field trip, and lots of opportunity for discussion and interaction among participants. And so we're doing our best to try and adapt that uh, to the online webinar format. Um, and we've tried to retain as many of those elements as possible. Um, we realize there are some downsides to the lack of face-to-face uh, -face interaction and in-person hands-on experience. But on the bright side, uh, we're able to reach many more participants than we would normally for various reasons. Um, so we're, we're happy to have all of you with us. Um, oopsie, sorry. Um, I just, I just wanted to mention that since this is the first time that we're offering this program online, um, we hope you'll be patient with us if we have technical difficulties and we encourage you to provide us with honest feedback about any suggestions you may have for improvements and there will be an evaluation sent around at the very end of the program on Thursday. Um, so um, you know, our objectives for the course, and, and Gretchen will be going briefly over the agenda, um, but we hope that participants will learn about habitat and water resource values of headwater streams, threats and current protections, remote and field-based identification methods, as well as local planning laws and policy to protect headwater streams and buffer areas, and urban issues and management. I also want to acknowledge um, that this has been a really difficult time for a lot of people and there's a lot of added stress and distractions in our lives. Um, so I just thought it would be good to take a moment to pause and get ready for the meeting. Um, so hopefully wherever you are, you can settle in, um, close your email or any other tasks that you might have open in this moment and um, anything that might distract you and I invite you just to close your eyes for a moment um, and take a few deep, slow breaths. Uh, think about why you chose to be here with us today. What matters to you? What are you hoping to learn from this program? So take another breath and I hope you'll carry this intention with you throughout our meeting today um, and take this moment to be present with us and, and learn and interact with this great group of other professionals and volunteers who really care about streams and are, have signed up for four afternoons of this program. So with that, um, I will stop sharing here and uh, our next speaker is Gretchen Stevens, who is the director of the Biodiversity Resources Center at Hudsonia. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, 
Glad you could uh, all join us for this webinar series. My name is Gretchen Stevens. I'm a biologist with Hudsonia and director of Hudsonia's Biodiversity Resources Center. Hudsonia is a nonprofit environmental research institute based uh, here in the Hudson Valley. We study the plants and animals and habitats of the region, uh, their ecology and their conservation. Uh, I want to just go through a quick uh, uh, overview of the topics we'll be discussing in this series. Today, uh, we'll talk about the definition of a stream, uh, not as straightforward as you might think, especially when it comes to defining a stream for jurisdictional purposes as in a stream protection law. We'll discuss the properties of uh, headwater streams. Uh, their water resource and ecological values, and some of the contributors to good water quality and habitat quality of streams. Uh, we'll discuss the multiple roles of buffer zones along streams, uh, serving both stream ecosystem and uh, the nearby human infrastructure. In sessions over the following three days, we'll talk about uh, threats to headwater streams, the existing regulatory protections for headwater streams at the state and federal levels, and how to find all the small streams that do not appear on public maps and are often overlooked in land use planning and environmental reviews, despite their great importance to local and downstream ecosystems. We'll point you to online resources for identifying streams and how to address headwater streams in environmental reviews of development projects. We'll also talk about assessing streams in the field uh, and we'll take a virtual field trip to see some different kinds of headwater streams and discuss their attributes. We'll say a few words about managing headwater streams in urban settings. And finally, we'll discuss some of the ways that local legislation can expand stream protections and can extend protection to the many streams that remain unnoticed and unprotected by existing laws and regulations. Before we get to the specifics of headwater streams, we first need to define what we consider to be a stream uh, more broadly. A definition composed from a hydrological or ecological point of view might be quite different from the definition that appears in a stream protection law, for example. But for now, let's just think about the hydrological and ecological aspects <clears throat> uh, without uh, concern for the competing interests and practicalities that need to be considered when drafting a law. For example, would you call the feature in this photo a stream? And why or why not? We're going to put up a poll um, on stream uh, on the kind of characteristics that you might use to define a stream. So, yeah. So, if we'd like each of you to. Uh, click on the choices here that make sense to you. And if you want to make other comments about characteristics that would define a stream, put those comments in the chat box and we'll look at those and um, discuss what everyone thinks here.
Hey, Gretchen, I stopped the, the polling, so uh, we got about half the folks to, to poll in. Okay. So is, um, can everyone see the, um, the results of the polling so far? Yeah, so um, this, is, uh, this is interesting. So a, f a few of you, but not a great many, have um, said that a stream uh, should carry flowing water year round. Um, more of you said it for uh, carry flowing water for at least six months. Uh, and a little less than half said at least one month per year. Uh, there are probably some other uh, variations on this in the chat box, which we'll look at in a second. 19% um, uh, said a stream should carry a certain minimum water volume to be identified as a stream. Um, and a little over half thinks a stream should have just discernible bed and banks. Um, not sure what the red band means here, but uh, many of you think that the, a stream should flow into another surface water body. Um, so it's not just a channel that runs for a little bit and then stops or maybe runs underground. And uh, only a few of you think that a stream should support uh, ne or needs to support fish. Um, let's see, I need to get to the chat box. A few uh, comments in the chat box. Um, John Mickelson said it's a linear wetland supporting hydrologic flows with hydric soils and or wetland vegetation. Um, so that suggests a uh, uh, at least flowing water. Um, and but it also says hydric soils or wetland vegetation. Andy Galler says provides water hydrologic flow to a larger stream or water body. Yep. Catherine says uh, a depression that carries water at any time and support, uh, supports wet adapted organisms and plants. Uh, Simon says uh, a, a headwater stream has no other streams flowing into them, but I'm not sure. We will talk about headwater streams in a second. Um, I see. And that's uh, about it for the, for the chat comments. Um, <clears throat> So I'm going to get rid of these results and my screen is not advancing. Do you, uh, Nate or Ingrid, know what I need to do to get this screen to start? Uh, try clicking on your screen again or possibly... Um, okay. There we go. Okay. Yep. Okay. Good. Thank you. <clears throat> so from, from a hydrological perspective, you might define a stream as simply any place that routinely collects and concentrates surface water and directs it to a down gradient location. Um, that definition would capture its significance for feeding other water courses uh, and uh, other, you know, lakes or ponds or wetlands, uh, larger streams. And would probably suffice from an ecological perspective too, although the actual ecological role would be much influenced by the frequency and duration of flow and the flow volumes and the substrates and the water quality and the landscape setting. In your roles as planning board or conservation commission members or as land managers or policy makers for land trusts or state parks or other agencies or as landowners yourselves, when considering protections for streams, I would urge you to think about their roles in the landscape. If a place is collecting and concentrating surface water and feeding it to down gradient areas, maybe that is sufficient 
to merit your conservation attention, whether or not there are any formal, that is, legal protections in place. Of course, for regulatory purposes, that is, for stream protection regulations, the characteristics of a regulated stream must be clearly defined and easily discernible. Um, understandably, the thresholds for jurisdiction often have more to do with these practical considerations and with political feasibility than with ecology or water resource benefits. Um, but from the regulatory standpoint, here are some examples of stream definitions in the zoning laws of some Hudson Valley communities. The town of Cortland in Westchester County defines a water course as any definable channel through which water flows continuously or intermittently. The town of Corn, uh, Cornwall in Orange County uh, defines a water course as a permanent or intermittent stream or other body of water, either natural or man-made, which gathers or carries surface water. The town of Woodstock in Ulster County has a more detailed definition. Uh, a water course is any natural, artificial, permanent, seasonal, or intermittent water segment with a discernible channel, bed, and or banks, and that usually flows in a particular direction. A ditch is considered to be a jurisdictional water course only if it discharges into a naturally occurring wetland, water body, or water course. Um, and there are other, you know, many other variations on this, and we can talk a, a little more about these definitions later. <clears throat> but why are we bothering uh, with these definitions? In this webinar series, we'll be discussing the ecological and water resource values of headwater streams, and we'll ask you to think about what kinds of streams may deserve protection, what kinds of protections, and whether or not those are offered by existing legislation. In the final session, we'll talk about ways to expand stream protections and extend them to additional deserving streams through local action, should you care to do that. In this program, we're especially focusing on what we call headwater streams. A typical definition of a headwater stream is a stream segment in the upper reach of a non-tidal stream where the average annual flow of the segment is five cubic feet per second or less. Headwater streams may include stream segments with perennial, intermittent, or ephemeral flow. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, headwater streams by this definition typically constitute more than 75% of the stream length in any watershed, and in total they drain approximately 70% of the land area in the continental U.S. So by these figures alone you can see that headwater streams are a very significant component of our landscapes. Here's a schematic illustration of the watershed of a stream that flows into the Hudson. You can see the main stem of the stream is joined by five tributaries. The watershed of the main stem is delineated by the red broken line, indicating the entire land area that drains to that stream before the stream joins the Hudson River. The area outlined with the broken blue line is the land area that drains to the upper part of that stream. Each of the smaller tributaries has their own smaller watershed or subbasin, such as this area <laughs> outlined in yellow, representing the land area that is drained by this small stream before it joins the larger stream. The headwaters are the upper reaches of each of these stream segments. Here are the headwaters of the main stem, and here are the headwaters of the smaller tributaries. <clears throat> Very briefly, here are some definitions of terms that will crop up here and there in this program. Uh, and these are pretty generally recognized definitions. Uh, a perennial stream is defined as surface water flowing continuously year round during a typical year. An intermittent stream as uh, surface water flowing continuously during certain times of a typical year, not merely in direct response to precipitation. And an ephemeral stream is defined as surface water flowing or pooling only in direct response to immediate precipitation, such as rain or snowfall. Headwater streams can take on lots of different appearances depending on their landscape settings. Some are even in urban areas where they've often been 
artificially channelized. But many headwater streams are quite inconspicuous. Many are unnamed, unmapped, and undocumented in any way. <clears throat> they're highly vulnerable to our treatment of the land and their watersheds, and they're often abused. Also, they represent a huge percentage of the total stream length in our landscapes and cumulatively have, a, uh, cumulatively, sorry, have a equally huge influence on all the downstream waters that they flow into. When we're thinking about protection of headwater streams, a further complication is that most are on privately held lands. So it's difficult to inform everyone about the values of these streams and how best to protect them. Those of you in public positions or on the staff of regional NGOs, though, have a platform for reaching hundreds or thousands of landowners in your policy making, your environmental reviews, your public planning, or your public education work. So that, that's the end of my introductory remarks. Um, now, uh, Emily Vale with the Hudson River Watershed Alliance will say a few words about the water resource values of headwater streams, after which we will answer questions that you've inserted uh, into the chat box. Thanks, Gretchen. Um, Emily, do you want to go ahead and share? Yep. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us this afternoon on our Headwater Streams workshop and the first online iteration of it. So uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the water resource values of Headwater Streams, building off of the foundation that Gretchen just laid for us today. So if you're not familiar with the Hudson River Watershed Alliance, we're a regional nonprofit. Uh, I'm based today in Kingston, but we cover the entire Hudson River watershed. We work to unite and empower communities to protect their local water resources through education, training, and networking, and through programs like the one that we're in today. Uh, so I just wanted to say a word from our sponsors. This presentation is specifically supported by the Hudson River Estuary Program and NUIPIC. So I'll talk a little bit more about what a headwater stream is and describe some of the physical components uh, that, that Gretchen mentioned are very important in defining these small streams and then particularly in understanding jurisdiction uh, over those streams. We'll talk about where they're found, why they matter, and then what's next. So one of the ways that we can define what a headwater stream is, is using the Strahler stream order. And this is, um, basically it defines as the first order streams as the smallest stream with a distinct stream channel. So once you see that channel sort of forming, that's a first order stream. And then once two first order streams come together, that becomes a second order stream and so on and so forth. And so um, usually headwaters are considered first or second order streams um, through this particular definition. Of course, there's lots of different ways to define them, um, but this can be a helpful way to sort of narrow down, you know, are we talking about a really big stream, a third order stream, fourth order, or is it more of a one and two headwater stream? So overall, these are small streams is what we're talking about today. So some of the, let me just make sure I didn't Great. Okay. So some of the physical components of a stream, uh, this schematic shows some of them. So the bed is the stream bottom, the bottom part of the stream where water is flowing. The banks are the sides of the stream. And the channel is the physical confine of the stream. So you see in this picture, the stream channel is fairly wide. It's wider than where the, the water is actually flowing in this moment. Um, and, and the channel can change based on flow. If it's higher flows, the water will go into the floodplain um, and the stream channel will become larger. Um, the riparian area is the interface between the land, the surface water, and the groundwater. And Beth will be up next talking much more about riparian areas. Um, and again, the floodplain is the area that's most likely to be inundated during high flows. And there are different ways to define floodplains and different ways to map them. Um, but again, during high water, those will become part of the stream channel where water is actively flowing across those areas. So as Gretchen mentioned, headwater streams make up a huge proportion of our, our overall stream systems. Uh, American Rivers estimated at 80% of all streams across the US. 
And headwaters are typically sort of at the top of the watershed. Uh, usually we think of them as sort of the higher elevation, uh, perhaps the higher gradient small stream. Streams, but they can also be lower gradient. They can be found in flatter areas. Uh, they might be found along the Hudson River or larger streams. And they're found in natural, rural, suburban, and urban areas, often sort of tucked away um, and hidden. This picture shows uh, a first order stream coming into the Hudson River at, at Athens. So Gretchen defined what a watershed is. Again, this is the land area where any precipitation that falls in that area will eventually go to a particular body of water. And the watershed is defined by topography. And small streams in a watershed context are really significant because they make up such a great proportion of our overall stream network. Um, so watersheds can be broken out into larger or smaller delineations. So uh, this map shows the Esopus Creek watershed. Of course, the upper Esopus is pretty distinct from the lower Esopus, separated by the Ashokan Reservoir. Um, but we can subdivide the lower Esopus into uh, the lower Esopus watershed, the Sawk Hill watershed, and the Platykill watershed, and think about how small streams connect with those. So uh, there's a star that's where I am today in Kingston, um, and there's uh, the watershed of the Tannery Brook, which is through the city of Kingston. So we've got the Tannery Brook and the Main Street Brook coming together to form a second order headwater stream. So even in this portion of the middle of the lower Esopus, we have some headwater streams right here in the city of Kingston. So in thinking about how these watersheds are delineated and how water actually gets from, you know, these places further from the, the main stem, you know, it is tributaries and then headwater streams that connect the watershed to that main stem. No, nope. that's where it meets the Esopus. So headwater streams are really important. They provide numerous water quality and water quantity benefits. They're an important source of drinking water supplies, and they also provide a substantial habitat value as well. Um, you'll be getting all of the copies of these slides afterwards, so I don't want to dwell on this. This is an infographic that was made uh, a number of years ago during the clean water rule. Um, and I just wanted to point out, again, a really high percentage, 60% of stream miles only flow seasonally or after rain, so those would be ephemeral streams. And one in three Americans get drinking water from seasonal and rain-dependent streams, so that um, these ephemeral streams are really important to our definition of headwaters as well. So for water quality, uh, headwater streams play a really important role in nutrient processing, storing, and transforming nutrients. And these streams have more water in contact with the soil than other larger streams. So the percentage of water that's in the channel, that's moving downstream, a higher percentage of that has contact with the soil, which is, allows for nitrogen transformation and other really significant processes. Um, about 64% of inorganic nitrogen entering a small stream can be retained or transformed within about a half a mile. And high levels of nutrients can really impact our downstream water, as we know, with harmful algal blooms and other impacts. Um, so small streams play a big role in helping to process that nitrogen and prevent it from potentially having harmful impacts downstream. Small streams can trap sediment. They slow down flows, particularly higher flows, and they give space to spread that water out and help recharge groundwater. They can store phosphorus and reduce impacts downstream. Their role in the carbon cycle is also significant. So uh, this graphic shows the river continuum concept of uh, Venoti et al, 1980. Um, and as we're in these higher portions of watersheds or, or higher portions of rivers and streams, we have more inputs of carbon that come in the form of logs, leaf litter, and so on. And the stream ecology is actually very well suited to breaking that down and having the, that food source become more available as it travels downstream for different types of, of stream critters, basically, the different aquatic insects and forms of aquatic life. So these headwater streams may be very distant from the downstream portions that are larger, but they play a really important role in supporting the food web downstream. Um, water quantity, they can help recharge groundwater. We talked about that. They can absorb runoff and help manage floods. Um, but unfortunately, small streams are frequently buried for flood management, which often has the 
opposite effect. So um, when we bury small streams or prevent them from, from receiving the water that, that is trying to flow downstream, um, we can have major impacts of flooding downstream. So small streams impact water quality and quantity downstream for better or for worse. They can help reduce nutrient levels, they can help process um, these inputs, or they can help contribute uh, to adverse effects like more flooding or more nutrients going downstream um, if they're not um, cared for. They are a critical part of the watershed system. So what happens in a small stream impacts the whole rest of the system. And they really provide a foundation for biodiversity and unique habitats. And we'll hear more about that in the presentations to come. Um, so people often assume that our large streams and rivers have greater ecological importance simply by virtue of their size. But this is far from the truth. In fact, the large streams would not even exist without all the smaller streams that feed them water, nutrients, and organisms. And the condition of the larger streams, the water volumes, the water quality, and the habitat quality is highly dependent on the condition of the smaller streams, beginning with the headwaters. But quite apart from that, headwater streams have tremendous habitat and water resource values in their own right. <clears throat> For example, these small streams are highly diverse uh, in both their landscape settings and in their uh, in-stream habitats. They contain habitats and microhabitats that are not duplicated in the larger streams and are essential to the many organisms that, that actually benefit from the small size, the shallow water, and the diverse habitat conditions. A whole array of in-stream habitats, such as pools, riffles, and runs, are used by fish, salamanders, and invertebrates in different seasons, in different life stages, and for different purposes, such as hunting, resting, and shelter, and in different environmental conditions, like heat waves, or high flows, or low flows, and are essential to the survival and perpetuation of populations. Uh, riffles, rapids, and falls help to incorporate oxygen into the stream water. Dissolved oxygen is an essential habitat component for most stream animals. <clears throat> Headwater streams uh, also support distinctive biological communities, including specialists that do not survive in larger streams for a variety of reasons. For example, some fish species move into headwater areas to spawn both because the stream substrates are more suitable for egg incubation uh, and because the nests and young are less subject to the predators that troll the larger stream segments. American eel shown here does not spawn uh, uh, here in our headwater streams, but it spends a good part of its, its life uh, in these streams, uh, both headwaters and, and the downstream areas. The invertebrate communities of headwater streams are often very diverse uh, and abundant, making these rich feeding grounds for their predators and also help to supply downstream segments with essential organisms that support the entire stream ecosystem. <clears throat> headwater streams are, are often provide uh, refuge from extremes of temperatures and uh, flow volumes in downstream segments. Uh, and also refuge from competitors and predators and non-native species of lower reaches. Headwater streams supply downstream reaches with invertebrates and organic detritus, uh, which serve as food and structural elements for downstream habitats. And these streams are intimately tied to the forests and meadows that they flow through. They receive organic detritus, like leaves and twigs and branches and seeds that provide structural materials for in-stream habitats and form the base of the aquatic food web. The invertebrates, the fungi, the substrates of headwater segments serve key roles in processing nutrients and making them available to the aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. When downstream <coughs> reaches have been overwhelmed, uh, by flood flows uh, and stream organisms have been washed away or buried by sediments, headwater streams supply new colonists to replenish those downstream populations. 
And the corridors of headwater streams provide cool, moist travel ways for animal movement uh, in and along the streams. Headwater streams provide habitat, both for aquatic and terrestrial animals, serving large areas of the surrounding upland habitats. Of course, beaver often uh, build dams on perennial segments of headwater streams, creating an impoundment that serves as a rich habitat for a great variety of plants and animals and marshes and open water areas, such as great blue heron, and green heron, tree swallows, snapping turtles, uh, painted turtles, spotted turtles, green frog, fishes, waterfowl, that could go on. Uh, American mink and river otter hunt along headwater streams and in beaver ponds. Raccoons forage for mollusks, and crayfish, frogs, turtles, and insects along streams. The Louisiana water thrush, a New York State species of greatest conservation need, nests along perennial segments of headwater streams as well as lower segments, uh, and especially those that run through forests. Wood turtle, uh, a New York State species of special concern, spends much of its time in and near perennial streams, including headwater streams. I could go on, but this brief introduction to ecological values of headwater streams uh, uh, I hope convinces you of their great importance, both as habitats in their own right and as sources of water, nutrients, structural materials, and organisms in downstream reaches. The conditions of headwater streams <coughs> uh, are highly influential on the condition of the, uh, I'm sorry, it, they are themselves uh, much affected by the condition of the land in their watersheds, that is all the land that drains to them. Whether the land is forested or open, paved or unpaved, vegetated or bare soil, all affect the water temperature, the water clarity, the quality of the detritus, the nutrient status, and the structural quality of the stream. The stream can be damaged by alterations to the volumes or timing of surface runoff that reaches it. Deforestation or pavement in the watershed, for example, can raise the stream water temperature and increase the flashiness of the stream flows causing large flows for short periods during and after storm events and then reducing base flows during drier periods. These changes can greatly alter the aquatic community that's able to survive and thrive in these streams. A stream that's allowed to spread out over a well-vegetated floodplain during high water events instead of being channeled by artificial berms, hardened banks or bulkheads will benefit in habitat quality diversity and stability. <clears throat> Streams that are unimpeded by artificial dams uh, and inadequate or suspended culverts are more likely to maintain the full complement of habitats and species uh, from their headwaters to their mouths. Streams that are free of non-native fishes such as brown trout, bluegill, largemouth bass, and other species introduced for recreational fishing or non-native crayfish species introduced as bait and other non-native species are much more likely to support the native aquatic communities that have developed and maintained the stream ecosystem over thousands of years. In tomorrow's session, Nate Nardi Cyrus will say more about the threats that can diminish the water quality, the habitat quality and the ecosystem services provided by headwater streams. Headwater streams will have an outsized importance uh, in this era of the changing climate. They can provide thermal refuge for species that cannot tolerate the warming temperatures in downstream areas. Headwater stre uh, streams that are fed by springs can be especially valuable for this purpose. I'll just, as a, an aside here, the difference between a, um, a spring and a stream. A spring is the, ac is the actual place where water, uh, groundwater emerges under pressure at the ground surface. So it's a, a place that you can go to and point to a, a, a single location. A spring, uh, the water from a spring often uh, is the beginning of a stream. 
So if you're at a spring and just look downslope, you might see a, a stream channel forming there. But the spring is where it actually, the precise location where it actually emerges from the ground. Um, and a stream is, is uh, the water that's flowing on the surface uh, after that water emerges from the ground. Um, headwater streams uh, also, as I mentioned before, provide cool, moist travel corridors for animals and plants uh, that need to migrate to cooler habitats at higher elevations as their traditional habitats are rendered unsuitable by the warming temperatures. Climate scientists predict more frequent and more intense large rainstorms causing catastrophic flood events that can be highly disruptive to downstream reaches. Headwater streams can serve the irreplaceable function of replenishing organisms and organic materials that help to restore the larger stream systems. Climate scientists also predict more frequent and more prolonged droughts over the coming decades. Headwater streams serve a valuable role in recharging groundwater supplies during the wetter, wetter times of years. Those are supplies that will be depleted by droughts just as surface water is depleted. Groundwater is not only the primary source of drinking water for most rural parts of the state, but it's also a significant source of water for wetlands, streams, and upland habitats. Headwater streams typically contribute a large portion of the water reaching downstream segments, estimated at 55 to 70 percent of the total water volume and so are essential to maintaining the flows that sustain those systems. The condition of the corridor along a stream, the riparian corridor, is key to the hydrology of the stream, the water quality, and the habitat quality, whether it's well vegetated or paved, or the bare soil of a crop field, whether it's forested or open, whether it's connected to the stream or is separated by artificial berms or walls, Beth Ressler with the Hudson River Estuary Program is going to say a few words uh, now about the special values of riparian buffer zones for maintaining the integrity of headwater streams. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, we're going to hold questions for after Beth's presentation. We'll have some more time for questions then. Beth, do you want to go ahead and share? Yep. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. Great. Hi everybody, I'm Beth Ressler. Um, I'm the Stream Buffer Coordinator for the Hudson River Estuary Program. Okay, there it is. Okay. Um, and I'm going to talk about stream buffers or riparian buffers and those, um, and I'm going to define them in just a second. So, um, so we've already sort of talked about it in some of the presentations today. The riparian area is that interface between the land and the water body, and it's the, the sort of the most influential area. And I like this, this um, picture here because it shows really a, a lot of what's going on is you're not necessarily seeing it. There's this association of the groundwater. Um, but in this, this one, the riparian area on the right is the area that has that groundwater interaction. But on the left, it's sort of, I'm sorry, Left is the groundwater interaction. Right is the side where it's a little steeper. And we're also seeing a lot of influence there too. And so, and then when you add the floodplain, which people often think of as being the same thing, that necess doesn't necessarily have the same the same geography. Both of them are really important to that stream, but you can see how they're kind of different um, because of the way that the influence, that immediate influence is. Um, and on the side here is a. From above, you can see that a riparian buffer, a riparian area, excuse me, riparian area is, if you if you try to um, de delineate it, it's not going to always be the same. You know, if there's a low place where lots of interaction with the soil, it might be wider and might be narrower in places where it's really steep next to the stream. Um, and here, just just for a comparison, we have the mapped floodplains. So these are the FEMA 100-year floodplains. Um, and then we have the, the buffer that, or the, the area, the, the riparian area in the middle that I just showed you. And then on the side, we have something that's a fixed width buffer. I think often when we're talking about regulating streams and, and protecting them, we talk about putting a hundred foot buffer around the stream. 
I just wanted you to see the difference between the area that's covered by the floodplain, what we would define as the riparian area, and then this fixed width buffer. Um, and now I'm going to define the word buffer. Um, so the riparian area is really that natural corridor that's like naturally protecting the stream. When we talk about a buffer, it's really like it tends to be more of a human defined thing where we say like we're going to vegetate, we're going to have this vegetated protected area between where humans are, are using the land and the stream. And so it's that protective vegetated area between. And on this picture, you can see on one side of the stream, you've got sort of a narrow buffer, which is better than nothing. But on the other side, you've got this much wider buffer. Um, and so from above, small streams, the buffers might not be as obvious, but um, here's, here's a Google Earth shot, and uh, you can see there's some different buffers here that I've pointed to with the arrows. And so the red arrow shows one that's not really buffered at all, it looks like. And this other one, I think there is one in the middle there. Um, it's hard to tell sometimes on the land in these, these uh, photos. It kind of just looks like a ribbon of trees. Um, and then in the, in the top corner there, you can see there's a wider buffer. There's a little stream going through that forest. So why do we want healthy buffers? This is a lot of the same stuff we've heard about streams, but the buffer itself specifically um, prevents this, the pollution getting into the stream, right? So it's that filter that slows down the water. Um, it filters that runoff, processes some of those nutrients. It reduces the erosion, erosion, so the sediment getting into the stream, so there's not as much sediment going downstream, it's staying in that, that section of stream. Um, in those that are appropriately forested, where, where it makes sense for them to be forested, it cools the stream, you know, that, that, um, that forest cover. But it also improves the processing within the stream, and so there's all kinds of studies that have showed that having that vegetation along the stream actually um, makes the processing of especially that nitrogen and phosphorus um, much more robust in the stream. So at, at also flood, uh, we did talk a little bit about flooding those streams, especially those many, many headwater streams, you know, it's so much of the, the stream uh, length is headwaters. All of those hold on to that water, slow it down before it gets downstream into these places where, um, where it, flooding might cause damage to human populations. Um, recharging groundwater, Gretchen talked about that. Again, you know, when you're slowing down that water before it gets into the channel, it has time to, to infiltrate, right? So um, slowing it down, not getting it running off so fast like a ditch would. Um, habitat, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Gretchen also talked about that. Um, there are studies that have shown that, that um, healthy riparian buffers do increase property value, um, and they're really important for, for recreation, you know, keeping those streams clean, but also maybe supporting fishing or other kinds of recreation along those streams. Maybe not the headwater, but maybe just down from the headwater stream. Um, they also have a really high economic value, and I, I'm not going to go into all the details of this slide, but there's this great study that came from the Delaware River Basin where they said that in general, um, $10,000 per acre per year in monetized benefits. And I think that's something that, you know, may be important to different types of people who would maybe not think that it's so valuable to protect these. Um, and in that same study, they did go into the fact that riparian buffers specifically might be more effective on some of these smaller headwater streams. So I think that's that's another thing that's important. I think we tend to forget about all these small streams and it's the buffers really do, you get a lot more bang for the buck when you do, they're, you're, make sure you're protecting those small streams. It's a lot easier to plant them um, if you're re, uh, revegetating them as well. Um, so fish don't really grow on trees, but <laughs> um, I like this picture because, and it's a lot of the stuff that Gretchen already covered, but this idea that, you know, the, the leaf litter that goes into those streams protect, you know, feeds the, the insects that feed the fish, um, but also there's the shade of those trees that, that um, helps protect the fish and also habitat. So when those trees fall down in the stream, um, they provide habitat for, for the fish. Um, and I, there's lots of studies that have shown that, that it's really important to have intact large trees that might fall down, right? So we think about trying to clean up the forest, but actually having a, a little bit of a messy forest with some, you know, snags and things that are going to fall into the stream is really important. 
um, who uses stream buffers. Uh, Gretchen covered a lot of these already. Um, but the reason that I put these in here is these are all organisms that really need that wide forested buffer around the stream. So the Louisiana water thrush, you know, they say it needs maybe 300 feet of stream uh, or feet of forest around that, that small moving stream. Um, word, turtle, word turtles are another one that needs that forest and are maybe not doing as well because of much of that habit is, habitat is going away. Um, so what does a healthy buffer look like? Um, and I know this one, this one picture has, uh, is not a small stream, but it's hard sometimes to see those small streams as we saw. And so that it, this idea that it really needs to be wide. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna have another slide where I sort of talk about the width of that, of, you know, what kind of ideal width are we talking about? But as many different plants. So we have an overstory, we have an understory, we have a midstory, we've got all different kinds of diversity in there. We really want them to be native to the point that's, that's possible. Um, or at very least not, you know, not problematic invasives. Um, they've shown that the, the, um, the in-stream biota really care about what kinds of leaves are coming in. So if you've got a lot of multiflora rose leaves coming in there, it's not as good for uh, the invertebrates. Um, and then shady, at least for those places that are appropriately forested, shade makes sense and we, that leaf litter is really important. Um, and there's just a picture of a stream. And I think, you know, it's just sort of keeping in mind that sometimes it just looks like some wet spots in a forest, but that really is a valuable stream. Um, and so the wider, the better with a buffer, right? And so what you get from a buffer, you know, people say, well, is, am I gonna get anything from a five foot buffer? Probably not. Like one line of vegetation isn't gonna do a lot of good. Is it better than nothing? Yes, but we really wanna go wider, especially if you're thinking about habitat. Um, and, you know, depending on what kind of habitat you're trying to protect, that buffer may need to be even wider. Um, so, again, it's, it's based on those goals and thinking about those goals, how wide of a buffer. Um, but what, what's the recommended minimum? Everybody always wants to know, and this makes sense if you're regulating. Um, it really does depend on that goal from that last slide. Um, and there's good literature that supports the fact that um, for all streams, when we're looking at all streams across all different sizes and shapes of streams, 100 foot is a minimum to really protect all those different kinds of functions. Um, and that doesn't even count some of the habitat functions that we want. Um, but I wanted to bring in also this uh, study in Oregon that looked specifically at headwater streams. And what they found is that 50 foot minimum of uncut stream. So no timber harvest, no kinds of trails and things like that is the most protective. And that's that's really, you know, the kind of ideally what we would want. Um, um, and this picture here shows sort of like thinking about a three tiered approach. So really you could have that 50 foot minimum buffer and then maybe in the 100 foot buffer, you might allow a little bit of thinning or you might have a trail that goes through or some, you know, something like that. And so that's that's what the literature is recommending. Um, so just just really quickly, some what does an unhealthy buffer look like? Well, it might be paved. Um, and I don't have any pictures of the berry streams here because they kind of look like parking lots. And Emily's going to talk about those later. But um, any kind of building and hard armoring or anything like that um, really is not good for the stream. It doesn't allow it to, to um, get into the riparian area or the floodplain area. But you can also see where mowing a stream right to the edge um, and this bottom picture, it really, you know, that stream is collapsing. Those grassroots don't do the kind of work that, that woody vegetation does. And so you've got all of this sediment that's falling into the stream and then being taken downstream here. Um, so those bare eroding banks are not good. Okay, and, and Nate's gonna talk more about threats to streams. And the, I think those are really very much the same threats that we have to riparian buffers. But in, again, invasive species, like I said, it's important what kind of leaf litter we're putting into those streams, but also some different kinds of vegetation cause different kinds of erosion. Climate change, while these streams are very important to climate change, they also will be affected by it. Um, and we have to be watching some of that vegetation and making sure that it can get through and is still uh, viable. Development, um, Emily's gonna talk more about urban streams later. Um, and this last one, I just wanna touch on it quickly. This idea of this tidy stream, we all have 
you know, there's a, there's a lot of things in our culture that want us to, to tidy things up and clean things up. And this stream is a stream that was straightened, all the vegetation was taken out. And it really, we really want to think about streams as being messy. Healthy streams are a little bit messy and that di diversity, that messiness really serves the stream. So we want to think about our buffers as having that diversity. And that's it for the, this section. Um, and I think I'm going to pass it back to Ingrid. <laughs>